Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association. Connecting alumni to the university and to each other, the Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. And from viewers like you, thank you. On January 31st, 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery in the United States. The vote was an early chapter in African American history. Today, there is only one national museum devoted to telling the full story from the beginning. An act of Congress established the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2003, but it didn't open until 2016. In this edition of Digging Deeper, Penn State President Eric Barron will explore the impact of this museum with its director, Lonnie Bunch III. So thank you so much for joining me. I've just been hearing so much from everybody about what a great seminar that you gave and, and hopefully, hopefully your visit at Penn State has been, been great. But I'm really curious, you're, you're, uh, you're responsible for this fantastic museum and we'll talk about the museum in a minute. But how did you get interested in, in this type of profession? To be honest, you know, all I've ever loved is history and the New York Yankees. But that's yeah. all I've ever loved, right? And so when I was finishing graduate school, I finished too late to get a teaching job. And I was broke. And there was a woman, an older student, she was probably 40, right? Um, and she said to me, well, you should talk to my husband. He works at the Smithsonian. And I remember thinking... Who works at the Smithsonian? It's where you take dates because it's free. Yeah. I mean, that was my notion. Yeah. And, I, and I went down and they introduced me to the head of the Smithsonian. I didn't realize what an opportunity they were giving me. And they said, well, would you like to work here? And I said, oh, okay, you know, uh, it's a museum. I'll work at the Museum of American History. And they said, oh, we don't have any jobs there. We have a job at the Air and Space Museum. And I said, no, I'm a 19th century historian. I don't know anything about air, space. I don't like planes. And the secretary of the Smithsonian said something brilliant. He said, how much are you making now? I told him. He said, we can make three times that if you become a curator at Air and Space. I said, I'm an Air and Space curator. So you're <laughs> responsible for the sixth most visited museum in the world, and this was because your timing was off <laughs> exactly. on, on, on job applications as a historian. That's a, that's a phenomenal story in its own right. So then what happens? You go, you go to the Air and Space Museum and... And I love it, but... I'm an academic, so I go teach at the University of Massachusetts for a couple of years, and suddenly I get this call from a museum in California saying the Smithsonian recommended you. And I wanted to say, you know, I, I only work two, I don't know much, but I took a chance and learned everything. I learned how to do exhibitions, learned how to work with the state legislature, um, and then the Smithsonian called me back and said, come to the Museum of American History, finally, uh -huh. um, as an associate director, and I loved it. I got to do exhibitions and work with people and thought that's where I was going to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and then the city of Chicago called and said, you want to be the head of the Chicago Historic Society? And I said, I don't know. And then I thought, but I really wanted to help people do the work they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Chicago and fell in love with it. And then the Smithsonian called again and said, would you come back to do this job? And I initially turned them down because, I, to be honest, I thought, this is such a big job. Can I really do this? That's a big uh, job. You yeah. know, and, and the fact that there was nothing, that you had to start from scratch with everything. But ultimately, I decided that I owed the Smithsonian, but I owed historians to try to tell a, create a museum that told a fuller story of who we were as Americans. Mm -hmm. And how, how long did it take before you could start to put a hole in the ground and start to visualize what was going to fill that hole. I would say that it took almost six years before we had a staff large enough to do some of the work to help me conceptualize this, to raise enough money to be confident that we could get the rest. Mm -hmm. um, because we had to do this in a way that said, it would be wonderful if we had the entire $540 million where we did anything. But part of the strategy was I had to demonstrate to people that this was going to happen. Yeah. Because this idea had floated around for so long. They had so to believe. For, exactly. Right. So part of it was putting a hole in the ground. Yeah. Saying, okay, there's progress in this. And so I would say that it was probably six years before I really believed that we could pull this off. Did you ever have doubts that it would work? 
At 2 o'clock in the morning. At 2 o'clock um, in the morning. But publicly? When you should have been sleeping, <laughs> exactly. but you were worrying. Exactly. Yeah, right. so just out of curiosity, I mean, people think about someone being responsible for a museum, and, and you might have a certain amount of stereotype, but clearly you had to be a good fundraiser. Exactly. How much money did you raise? We raised total $570 million. Um, and so some of that was federal, but as you know, with the federal government, you still have to raise it within the federal government. You right. have to convince Congress yep. this is the moment. And we also had to raise money, not just for the building, but for me to hire staff. Yeah. So it was really this iterative process of saying, is this the year I go to help the staff grow? Is this a year we need some capital money? How do I leverage the private money that we raise with the federal money? So it really was this kind of process where I described it. It was like going on a cruise at the same time you're building a ship. Yeah. You know, in a university environment, when we're trying to do a project, we often think about it as if we can get a couple of lead gifts, mm. then people really believe that it's going to happen. You had lead gifts? Absolutely. What we did is we first thought that we needed to go to the foundation community because, candidly, I didn't have a staff of 20 to do something, but I could write a grant. Mm -hmm. um, and so once we got the foundations involved and they gave significant money, we were able to sort of begin to go to, fa to the corporations and to say, we need a few lead gifts. People like Aflac and Boeing came in very early um, and that helped us then leverage those lead gifts. But the bottom line was that we had to show progress because even though the Smithsonian said we're going to do this, there were a lot of people who thought, this has been tried for many, many years. And, and hasn't. So how important were the little gifts? The little gifts, in my mind, were so important. I decided to create a membership program where people from $25 to $100 would get a membership card as a founding member. People loved it. Um, I would go around the country and I'd get off the airplane and I'd say, I've got my card. Mm. And so it became real for them. And then it also allowed me to use those members as way to help me with Congress. Mm -hmm. So I actually know every number of members I have in every congressional district. So there's tremendous amount of effort. You have the hole in the ground. Big I hole. think you told me you had a big hole in the ground and you didn't have the money to finish the project, but you doubted that Congress would allow a big hole to stay there. That right you next knew, to the Washington yeah, Monument. A little nervy, right just, next to the Washington just Monument. Just a tad. Okay, so now you're doing the design. And one of the things that struck me as so different than any other museum that I have ever been in is that you're walking through time. Yes. And in a, in, in a, in a fashion, and it's quite a long walk. <laughs> so, so how long is the walk? Let, let's just say the walk is almost a mile. Almost a mile, mm -hmm. at, f deep inside the earth and a really big hole in you're, front of the Washington You're 80 line. feet down below yeah. ground. So wow. how did that idea of, of having people actually walk through time how did that come about? You know, I had never in my career done anything where you had to follow a certain path. Right? I just thought, you know, give people freedom and choice. Here's an exhibit. That's Here's right. Here's an you exhibit. Go whichever Choose way which you, one want. you want. Right. But instead, I said, you know, people need a narrative. People need to understand that history and how it shaped us all before they go explore music or the military or sport. So we can that was the overriding notion. And then work with designers to say, can we make a hole that big? Can we tell the story to have large artifacts? And so what has happened is it's a journey and yeah. you know it's a long journey and um, but the other hand it gives people a sense that history isn't linear that you go forward you go back, back. you go forward you go back and and that it's an uphill strive struggle uh -huh. and so i think that was part of the strategy to say you're going to immerse yourself you're not going to be able to sort of pick and choose right. immerse yourself in the story so in immersing yourself in the story of course you have to have all the things to tell this story what, what is that like? At what point are you starting? Do you have big warehouses somewhere that as the money was coming in, you were also collecting all sorts of interesting? My biggest fear was not raising the money. It was finding the artifacts because people said to me, well, don't worry, you could make it a museum driven by technology. But that would fail at the Smithsonian because you come to see the right flyer or the ruby slipper. Right. And so for me, it was creating the idea that we stole from Antique Roadshow to say, how do we go around the country, help people bring out their stuff? And as a result of that, we can build collections. And out of the 45,000 artifacts we collected, 70% came out of basements, trunks, and attics of people's homes. That's unbelievable. 
I'm so glad because I wasn't sure that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, but I never forgot early in my career, I was collecting in this woman's house and she said to me, I have nothing. She said, go down to the basement. Sure enough, there was great stuff there and that reminded me to do that. That's unbelievable. Is somewhere there like a catalog of where all the, all the interesting things come from? In fact, yes. We're actually going to put online because you, we know the stories of each artifact. So we're going to let people know that and be able to understand it. Whereas like in other museums, you forget where something came from or the richness of the story. But that must be fairly unique yeah. Yeah. to think that this came out of people's attics. And it's so profound at the same time. What about some of the other exhibits for, for instance, I guess it was the Woolworth um, uh, a story mm -hmm. in which, you know, you really sort of can visualize the amount of hate and the degree to mm -hmm. which people um, stood their ground exactly. and in, in, the, in the face of, of that. And it's recreated. Yes. What we wanted to do was give people a real sense of both what it was like to sit at those counters, but also the kind of cacophony that was the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. the pressure, the courageousness. And so what we hoped is that we'd create new generations of people who understand that your obligation is to make America better. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we wanted to create something where you understood what courage it took for people to help move a country forward. Mm -hmm. So is this part of your, um, your I, I, I think, getting to be well-known quote that this is a quintessential American story? Absolutely. One of the reasons I took this job was that I heard many people saying, we can build the best black museum in the world. And I thought that was so limiting that this was a story that was bigger than one community. Yeah. And so I felt that if we wanted people to understand America, our core values of optimism, spirituality, resiliency, where better to look than this, than this story? Mm -hmm. So I really framed it by saying, yes, you will see the African-American story, but through that lens, you're going to learn the American story. Mm -hmm. So the museum comes out of the ground, beautiful building, this wonderful walk that you take through time with, in my view, a lot of stressful moments. Yes. If you, um, it, yes. Um, and the door is open. And what did you think would happen? I didn't know. I mm -hmm. really, two weeks before we opened, I suddenly became panic stricken because not that I was worried about, you know, could we get the paint dry and all of that. Mm -hmm. I was more worried about, was I right? You know, that it, having a kind of linear exhibition, telling, did I find the right tension between moments of difficulty and moments of resiliency? Yeah. Because I had always listened to people but this museum had my fingerprints on it, maybe more than anything else, and so I was really worried. Yeah. So when we opened, and you suddenly see people coming in and crying mm -hmm. and sharing their stories with strangers mm -hmm. or laughing to say, you know, we can continue to help make a country better, it's been the most humbling, overwhelming thing of my career. It's become a pilgrimage site for all kinds of people, and literally, when I walk through the museum, I have to leave because I'm crying because the way people share their stories. Mm -hmm. And did I hope it would be this impactful? Sure. But mm -hmm. did I really know? Of course not. Um, okay, well, I really appreciate you hearing that. Somehow in my mind, I thought you would tell me the attendance as the thing that would tell you you did it right. Well, that does help. It does I mean, help. You know, of course, it does help. The, but, but really, it's people's, you're, you are getting to witness how it, is in, how it influences people to be in your museum. It's become a place that matters, yeah. and that's what I want. I mean, I love having the crowds, huge crowds, mm -hmm. more than we could ever anticipate. You know, mm -hmm. we thought we'd get 4,000 people a day, we'd get 8,000 people mm -hmm. a day. Um, but it really is the fact that people are dipping into this reservoir yeah. and adding to the reservoir, taking away things that allow them to see. I mean, there's nothing more powerful than watching a grandmother in a wheelchair, putting her five-year-old granddaughter on her lap and talking about Fannie Lou Hamer or Martin Luther King and what that meant to them. And so, mm -hmm. in a way, it's really become the place where you can have those conversations that inspire, those conversations that are often difficult. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's, I think that really tells you you did, you did a phenomenal job. 
how does it stay? How, how, what, what, what's your future projection for the types of things that might be there? I mean, when you started all this, you didn't have a Barack Obama, for right. example. That's so right. how, how, do, how, how does this evolve in your mind? I think first thing we do is that every quarter I sit down with my research staff and we say, if it's 50 years from today, mm -hmm. what would scholars, curators want to have collected? Yeah. So then we'll go out and collect that kind of material. But also we're thinking about what are the kinds of exhibitions that now that we've got, in essence, a foundation, mm -hmm. what are different stories we want to tell? Um, and so we really see this as an evolving museum mm -hmm. that will continue to tell stories that will make us cry but also inspire us. Mm -hmm. My hope is that we've created through this museum generations of people, not so much who are activists, but who realize that this is an amazing country that's made better when people demand that it live up to its stated ideals. Mm -hmm. And we expect new generations who go through the museum to understand that. Yeah. Can you give us a hint of the types of things you're thinking about that you're collecting? I'm just curious. Absolutely. We've collected things that I would have never expected. We went to Baltimore after Freddie Gray um, was killed. And what we did is we actually collected the home videos that people did on their phones to get mm -hmm. people's sense of what this meant. Uh -huh. um, you know, we also collect, we sit down and say, in terms of popular culture, film, television, what should we collect? So we collected hidden figures that film about black women in the space industry. And um, so it's really looking at what are things that may be politically important and what are things that are culturally important as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That must in itself be fun and interesting to be looking at today through the eyes of a historian who wants to make sure that in the future that's there. It, it, what it comes from is early in my career, there were often times I wanted to tell stories. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, a museum would have stuff, and they wouldn't have it. Because what I realized is museums are really driven by curatorial passion, scholarship. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have scholars that are interested in X or Y, it might not be collected. Mm -hmm. So I decided rather than leave it to an individual, I said, let us come together collectively, identify what some of those stories are, and then go after it. So one of the things that also interests me is, unlike a lot of the other museums on the mall, um, you can find African-American history and culture in the National Galleries and in Air and Space and in the Museum of American History. Does this work? Do you, do you get to collect it all? In fact, my decision was not to collect it all. Mm -hmm. um, that you I would rather be everywhere. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, and the notion was that now if the Smithsonian Museums could talk to each other, what we've really done is created different portals into what it means to be an American. Mm -hmm. So you may come to that through the Air and Space Museum. And yes, you'll see the right flyer, but you'll also learn about the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. Or you'll go through the Smithsonian Art Museum, mm -hmm. and you'll see this some amazing artwork, but you'll also see African-American visual creativity. So my goal was to never be the only place that had that, but really rather just be one of the many portals to help us give mm -hmm. a different lens into mm -hmm. understanding who we are as a nation. I, 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 I think that that's in, incredibly important and, and why, why is on your part. So in having that connectivity and seeing uh, it's everywhere, which is where it should be, yes. how important was it to be on the mall? Crucially important. Mm -hmm. um, when the Congress said, we may have some sites on the mall, some sites off the mall, I knew that the mall was America's front yard. It's where the world comes to learn what it means to be an American. Um, and I thought this museum would help not complete, but enrich our mm -hmm. understanding of who we were. And I felt that its story deserved to be on the mall. So mm -hmm. I was unbelievably gratified and humbled when we got on the mall. So w today, um, we live at a time with a different type of unrest and issue. Um, how important is what you're doing in, in that context? You know, the museum has become even more of a symbol and a metaphor in a way in today. Because what has happened is that as people are really debating 
what's the soul of America? What's the direction mm -hmm. of America? This museum becomes one of those places where you can come in in a safe space and explore that question and think about it historically and use that history to give you tools yeah. to live your life and to grapple with these debates. I mean, mm -hmm. my notion is that often the debates that we have around America's identity or the politics of memory, often people don't have a lot of knowledge. Yeah. It's basically passion. So the museum wants to be that place where you can get some of that knowledge to help create reasoned debate. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, another, an example uh, of, of that debate is the NFL and taking a knee. And you exactly. wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post. And, and what's your take on this? Well, my notion is, first of all, the, one of the greatest things about America has been the opportunity to realize that often protest is the highest form of patriotism. And so part of my notion was that let us not penalize people for expressing their rights. Yeah. But I also wanted to suggest that there are things we can learn from people who say, you know, I'm a privileged athlete, but I care about police brutality. Um, what it means to me is that this is one of those moments where you get to debate who we once were and who we can become. Mm -hmm. And those are the moments as a historian I love to see happen. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, fascinating, fascinating. One last question I got to ask you here is, you've got a lot of children in that museum. Do you have a favorite? Are you allowed to have a favorite? <laughs> <laughs> I, I change it. I change it weekly. Oh, you do. Uh, well, but, that's a wonderful but, thing. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you what I love. I love. We have this slave cabin from Edisto Island in South Carolina, and it's a cabin that, when it was used during slavery, had one door. You came in and out for control. As soon as the community gained their freedom, they put a second door in. And mm -hmm. somehow for me, the notion that a door is a concrete manifestation of freedom is just so powerful to me. It so is. I go it there is. and I look through that door almost every day. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It, it's, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoyed it a great deal. Dr. Barron, thank you so much for joining me. Sure. I'm really excited to check out the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture after that conversation. You, you, yes, fantastic museum. And when you went, you said that it was like walking through time. Tell me it some is. of your emotions as you experienced that for the first time. Well, you know, I, I couldn't have said it better um, than, than this notion that, that you're seeing struggle and stress in very painful moments and at the same time, uh, at the sense of progress and hope and, and successes as you, as you walk in this spiral. And you have the opportunity to see, to sit and, and watch, watch videos. So you are really feeling a lot of emotion as, as you go through. You know, uh, one of the most powerful uh, for me was a, a mother who, whose son is beaten and she decides that people have to see him. And that must have been extraordinarily painful. But her sense was it is more important that people realize what, what people are doing to other, what humans are doing to other humans in this process. So to me, this is sort of a jolting uh, moment that you're thinking about. And I can't imagine what, how that mother uh, felt about it. Uh, but but so then and then you move to times of hope and times of success and times of, so it it's uh, it's very moving. What makes this museum different from other museums that you might have been in before? Well, f I love the Smithsonian. I just love the Smithsonian. And you are seeing exhibits, and you move into a, you know uh, an exhibit about moon rocks, or you. Uh, move into uh, uh, an exhibit about uh, a particular airplane and its history or Apollo um, or to presidential gowns or whatever it is through history that you do. And you see yourself as seeing uh, fascinating things. And in this museum, you move through time. It's a very different perspective. It, it, and... Um, 
it's possible that it's a little bit, would have been viewed as a little bit risky mm. because you have to walk nearly a mile to go to, to, you go down in an elevator and then you walk nearly a mile to come out uh, on, the, on the ground floor. So that's not, that's not a, that's not typical. That's right. But it really works. And some students, they will say, you know what, I have had civics classes, I've had civil rights classes, I know about history, I know about African American history, and they would say to you, why should I go? So what do you say to the, that student if they ask, why should I go? Well, I think very few people see that perspective of through time, the, the, the sway back and forth between something horrible and how could humans do that to, to this profound sense of hope. So I certainly think that's part of it. But I also have to say that in many cases today, and looking back, we see particular people and profound moments. In this museum, you see many, many people and profound moments, and many quotes, and many words of wisdom, and many different examples. And so it does seem to me to reflect history and culture, not just, not just um, what you might view as where we usually go. Thank you so much, Dr. Barron. My pleasure. Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association. Connecting alumni to the university and to each other, the Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. And from viewers like you, thank you.